Today's video was made possible by Masterworks. Masterworks is the only platform making it possible to be a part owner of a multi-million dollar work by iconic artists like Picasso, Andy Warhol, and many more. You can skip Masterworks waiting list by using our link down below. More on this later. On the 25th of December, 1991, the then president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, gave this speech. In this speech, he not only announced his resignation, he also announced the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the end of communism. I don't know if you realize the significance of this moment. Communism in the USSR did not fall because of a popular revolt, nor did it fall because of war. It was the communist leader himself who one day said, guys, we've realized that this doesn't work and that we have to become capitalists. So Merry Christmas, I'll see you around. Many of you will say, how novel? Bet they never saw that coming. And the truth is that up until that moment, the Soviet Union had been the second most important power in the world. Not even the most fervent anti-communists could have imagined that communism would collapse under its own weight. So the question is, why did communism fall in the Soviet Union? In this video, we're going to find out. The Soviet Union is like your great-grandparents. You may have been told a lot of things about them, but you haven't really met them or have little or no memory of them. It's the same with the Soviet Union. We all know that they had a communist system and they were victorious in World War II and then started a Cold War with the United States. However, these days mark the 30th anniversary of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And a month ago, we saw a Bloomberg tweet with a phrase from the Chinese president that caught our attention. We all knew that in the USSR, there was a shortage of many things, but let's be honest, testosterone was not one of them. All those in charge were men. And in any case, this is what Xi Jinping said in 2012 in a speech months before he became president of China. That's why we really wanted to talk about the USSR. We want to take stock of Soviet communism, to recognize its achievements, of which there were some, and to point out its mistakes. Of course, in this video, we are going to summarize more than 80 years of history in a few minutes, so there will be a lot of details that we won't be able able to cover. So today we're going to focus on one question. Why did communism fall? What happened so that on the 25th of December 1991, the leader of one of the world's greatest superpowers resigned and announced a complete change of political system? And why did Gorbachev's reforms fail? Today, in this Visual Politics Soviet special, we are going to answer these questions. But first, let's take a look at a bit of history. The birth of a superpower. In 1929, the United States suffered the Great Depression. While the entire capitalist world was in the throes of a savage economic crisis, the communist East was experiencing its golden age. That's right, Russia was transforming from an almost medieval and agricultural country into an industrial power. In fact, there are estimates that the Soviet Union was one of the fastest growing countries in the world. And yes, I say estimates because GDP did not start to be used as a macroeconomic indicator until 1937. But that's another story. The important thing is that Russia was on fire. But how is that possible? Isn't communism not supposed to work? Think about it. There is something worse than communism, and that is the lack of any system. Up until the Russian Revolution, the Tsars limited themselves to going from one war to the next, and to finance them, they were printing rubles and squeezing their subjects by collecting taxes. Suddenly, the communists arrived, and the state began to use all the money it collected to invest. Suddenly, the Russians had more modern education, infrastructure, and production systems. Economic centralism transferred resources from the countryside to the cities. 
The Soviets believed that industrialization had to be done on a large scale to be successful. The output of the factories had to be large enough to justify the high initial cost of building them. Therefore, after Stalin's first five-year plan in 1928, the capital invested in industrializing the country increased by 336%. The number of peasants expelled from the farms and incorporated into industry grew by almost 190%. All this yielded good results. Although slightly below expectations, industrial production grew by 170%. Stalin said the same thing as in Jurassic Park. We spared no expense. Then came the dinosaurs. But for now, you have to see what the Soviet park looked like. One serious problem, however, is that agricultural collectivization didn't work. Stalin tried to extract resources from agriculture by force, and it was a disaster. He wiped out the Kulaks, who were the most prosperous farmers, and nationalized the draft animals, which resulted in them being slaughtered by the farmers. The result speaks for itself. Agricultural production fell by more than a quarter compared to 1928. But Stalin was not exactly the kind of ruler who tolerates criticism. The repression was terrible. Major Soviet paper says 20 million died as victims of Stalin. The worst thing about the 1930s is that you were a nobody if you didn't invade another country. So Stalin thought it was a good idea to sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Nazi Germany to divide up half of Poland, annex the Baltic Republics, and occupy Bessarabia, which is today's Moldova. Over. Then Hitler betrayed him and almost wiped out the Soviet Union, because by that time, Stalin had carried out a brutal purge within the Red Army, liquidating practically all of its top commanders. Finally, the victory in World War II confirmed the Soviet Union as one of the two great superpowers of the world. The Cold War began. But before we continue, one moment. Inflation is a word that's been getting thrown around a lot lately, and not only on this channel. Simply put, inflation erodes the purchasing power of money. In other words, your hard-earned cash doesn't go as far. Even slight inflation at an annual rate of 3% halves the value of money in 24 years. So if your long-term investments are not at least outpacing inflation, your money's not doing anything for you. In the past, the usual way to hedge against inflation was to invest in gold, stocks, or even real estate. But these days, there are new alternatives, and we want to show you a very interesting one, art. The art market is valued at $1.7 and Deloitte estimates that it could grow another $900 billion by 2026. What's more, it's proven to be very profitable. Contemporary art returned 23.2% during periods with over 3% inflation, which is basically the situation we are in now. The S&P 500 returned 3.8%. In fact, among the extremely wealthy, art is a very typical choice. For generations, billionaires from the likes of Jeff Bezos to Bill Gates have used art as a means for stashing their fortunes. Okay, I'm sure at this point you're probably thinking, but Josh, what does that have to do with me? I don't even know anyone with that sort of disposable income. I'm not a billionaire. Well, hold on a minute, because that's where Masterworks comes in. Masterworks' mission is to make it possible for anyone to invest in great works of art through fractional shares. With Masterworks, you can buy shares in pieces of art that help to protect you from inflation and could even make you a significant return. Since launching in 2019, they've returned over 30% to their investors every year, which is pretty impressive, considering how much of a roller coaster the markets have been on. So it's no surprise that they were recently valued at over a billion dollars. Just go to the website by using our link below to skip the waitlist and create an account. After that, you can browse their selection of works like this painting here by Pablo Picasso and select how much you want to invest. When Masterworks sells the painting, you get your portion of the proceeds. And as always, in everything related to investment, tread carefully. Remember that nothing is risk-free. From peak to collapse. I'm sure you've all heard it at some point, Soviet communism didn't work because people had no incentive to work. Well, yes. And at the same time, no. If you follow our sister channel, Mega Projects, you'll already be familiar with many of the Soviet breakthroughs. The Soviet Union could boast many of the most brilliant minds in history. In fact, during the early years of the space race, Russia was well ahead of the United States. At that time, there was a similar feeling in the West as there is today about China. There was a real fear that the Soviets would surpass the United States. And in general, the capitalist world Old, economically and militarily. Think about it. There was hardly any information about what was happening on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And the Soviet censorship machine was very good at covering up its shameful deeds. And the truth is that there was a lot of shame to cover up. You could say that it was in the mid-1960s that Soviet communism began to run out of steam.
but the discovery of oil in Siberia offered a respite to the Communist Party. In any case, the problem with the Soviet economy was that it had very low productivity. The USSR was stagnating in the 70s, and you will say, but why? Where was the problem? And this is where one of the few economists who did predict the collapse of the Soviet communism comes in, and he did it several decades before it happened. We are talking about Ludwig von Mises. In his work, Socialism, Mises explains the main differences between a centralized economy and a free economy. In a free economy, entrepreneurs identify inefficiencies that they try to find solutions for. Some get it right and get rich. Others fail and disappear. But in general, capital tends to concentrate in the most efficient sectors. And how do you know which sectors are the most efficient? Through the price system. If I see that the price of a good is very high, it is because there is a lot of demand for that good. That is, there is a need for more supply. However, in a centralized economy, capital is not distributed according to economic, but to political criteria. That is, the state can invest in sectors Sectors that are not necessarily the most efficient. That explains why a socialist regime can be successful in the short term. The state spends lavishly and can even create sectors that would otherwise be unthinkable. Do you want an example? Heavy industry in a country like Russia, which went from being an agricultural country. The problem? In the long run, deficiencies began to appear that go undetected because there is no competition and no accountability. I'll give you an example. The history of the Aral Sea. You see, the Aral Sea was once one of the four largest lakes in the world. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union made a lot of water diversions to bring all that water to the cotton fields. This type of project would have been virtually impossible to do in a capitalist country. The state would have had to go through years of litigation to get all the property. And the price of all that land would be so expensive that, in the end, only a few small transfers would have been made. However, in a communist country, there is no private ownership of land. So someone in an office in Moscow decided that a mega diversion had to be made overnight. Suddenly, the lake was reduced to 10% of its original size. In addition to the ecological disaster, there is also an economic disaster. What could have been a perfect area for cultivation is now practically a desert. Now imagine this example replicated in a thousand and one other cases. The history of the Soviet Union is a history of lots of megalomaniac projects. Cities like Magnitogorsk, for example, were created overnight. Many of these projects may not necessarily have been bad ideas. The problem was that, without a pricing system, they didn't know how much needed to be invested to make real economic sense. Add to that the lack of freedom of speech, and no one dared to point out the inefficiencies. What was once one of the fastest growing economies in the world ended up stagnating. The 1979 oil crisis sent the price of crude oil skyrocketing, which pumped lots and lots of dollars back into the Soviet economy. That got the Politburo fired up, and someone in the Kremlin thought it was a good idea to invade Afghanistan. Today, we already know that to raid Kabul and the surrounding area is similar to jumping off a cliff. The Soviets did not escape the Afghan trap. Suddenly, they were caught up in a continuous spiral of increased military spending. But beware that it was not only the Afghans' fault. Ronald Reagan also had a lot to do with it. Lies and rigged Star Wars test fooled the Kremlin and Congress. It wasn't as powerful as the Death Star, but Reagan pulled a space shield out from his sleeve to protect himself from a nuclear attack that sent the Kremlin into a panic. The communist leaders spent millions and millions trying to replicate something that was simply impossible because it was nothing more than an American mockery. This trick meant absolute ruin for the USSR's economy. The question being thrown around at the time was clear. Was it too late to try and change the Soviet Union? Let's take a look at that right now. Perestroika The Soviet Union reached the 1980s with the old guard at the helm. It had become a full-blown gerontocracy. The average age of members of the Politburo was 70, compared to 55 at the time of Stalin's death. And believe me, the experience is a bonus, but it also has its risks. In less than three years, three general secretaries of the Communist Party died. Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko. The regime was showing signs of breakdown. For example, corruption was plaguing the Kremlin. The Great Cotton Scandal had just been uncovered, directly implicating one of the Politburo bigwigs. It was not an isolated case. The scandals of communist leaders could no longer be covered up, even by the strictest censorship. 
So the reforms had a long list of reasons when they secured the appointment of Mikhail Gorbachev as the Soviet Union's top leader in 1985. By all accounts, he was a young man. He was 54 years old and eager to change things. He tried to do so right from the start, but his reforms soon faced a major test, the worst nuclear accident in history. Chernobyl once again exposed the lack of transparency of the Soviet authorities. 20 years after the catastrophe, Gorbachev himself was clear about it. The nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl, even more than my launch of Perestroika, was perhaps the main cause of the Soviet Union's collapse five years later. Mikhail Gorbachev, April 2006. The Chernobyl cover-up was lethal for the USSR. The Soviet authorities took several days to report the accident. The first information about the catastrophe came from Sweden, where an increase in radioactivity was detected. So the people of Ukraine and the rest of Eastern Europe had been going about their normal lives, unaware that they were being exposed to the worst of the radioactive cloud. For Gorbachev, this was a sign that the Soviet system needed deeper reforms than those already underway. These were made under the banner of perestroika, which means restructuring in Russian. It encompassed a set of measures designed to gradually liberalize the economy and the political system. Steps were taken towards a limited free market and decentralization of the Soviet economy. An important part of these reforms was glasnost, meaning transparency. The press and television began to include positions contrary to the socialist project. All this led to relatively free elections in 1989, which definitively showed that the Communist Party was completely discredited in the eyes of the people. Soviet voters deal humiliating blow to party officials. The fall of the Berlin Wall at the end of 1989 was the first sign that the communist bloc was beginning to crumble. Throughout 1990, legislative elections were held in each of the 15 Soviet socialist republics. For the first time, the opposition to the Kremlin was free to say what the Communist Party Politburo did not want to hear. So the opportunity the nationalists in each of the republics had been waiting for had arrived. The three Baltic republics did not waste a second to begin their transition to independence. Other territories claimed their own sovereignty, such as the Russian Soviet Republic, led by Boris Yeltsin. The disintegration of the USSR had began its cooldown. Everything accelerated in August 1991, with the failed coup d'etat carried out by the KGB and the hardliners of the Communist Party. There was no turning back. The Soviet Socialist Republics decided to do away with the USSR. In his resignation speech as President of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev exposed the absolute failure of communism. Да и умом и талантами Бог не обидел, а живем куда хуже, чем в развитых странах. Причина была уже видна. Общество задыхалось в тисках командно-бюрократической системы. Так дальше жить было нельзя. Надо было кардинально все менять. Dismantling the Soviet Union was the last thing on Gorbachev's mind. He believed that the communist regime could move towards a social democracy that had the support of the people. But after decades under the yoke of Soviet power, when you give people a chance to speak out, all they want is something very simple. They want freedom. The truth was simple. The Soviet Union was impossible to reform. On the 25th of December 1991, its flag was lowered in the Kremlin. That was the end of the hammer and sickle. In its place, the tricolor flag of the Russian Federation began to fly. And many of you will say, so what happened next? And has Russia really done well under capitalism? Well, we'll talk about that in another video that we'll be releasing soon. In the meantime, here's a question for you. Do you think that the Soviet Union could have avoided its disillusion? More importantly, what do you think of Gorbachev? Was he really a hero of democracy as many would have you believe, or was he a victim of events? You can leave me your answer in the comments. And of course, don't forget that we have new videos every week. So subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our updates. If you liked this video, like it, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.